sitting almost slap bang in the centre of the Mediterranean, only 60 miles south of Sicily and 220 miles north of the deserts of Libya, sits the island of Malta. Due to its position enhanced by beautiful natural harbours, Malta has from the earliest times attracted many powerful nations to her shores. The Phoenicians were the first, then in chronological order came the Carthaginians, the Romans, Byzantines, Arabs, Normans, Schwabians, Angevins, Aragonese, Castilians, the French and finally the British. This long line of foreign domination has given the Maltese people a truly international character and enriched their culture. Over thousands of years of vivid history, Malta has been the meeting place of Eastern and Western cultures. Indeed, it's said to be the smallest nation with the longest history. Often ruled, never truly dominated, the Maltese islands command a prominent place in European history. Their past is marked with violence, intrigue and courage, shown during battles, fought over the centuries for their strategic position. Much of Malta's history revolves around the Knights Hospitallers of St. John, an order of Christian brothers whose original task of caring for the sick gradually shifted to the military one of fighting the infidels. The order still thrives today and one of its factions can be seen at most large gatherings, that of the St. John Ambulance Service, which still has as its emblem the Maltese Cross. Malta is not a lot bigger than the Isle of Wight, yet has a population of some 400,000 people. As the longest distance you can drive in any one direction on Malta is just over 16 miles, it's possible to see a great deal in a short time. The jewel in the crown of Malta is the twin towns of Rabat and Medina. Medina is unique among Malta's cities can best be described as the counterpart to Valletta. From the walls of the present capital, one gets a good view of the harbour entrances and ocean, whereas from Medina's walls, one can see a wide expanse of the island's landscape, with the ocean on the far horizon. The heavy motor traffic of Valletta is distracting, whereas in Medina's narrow streets, motor vehicles are rare. Valletta is the pulsating heart of the island's nation. Medina, on the other hand, is known as the Quiet City, in which numerous churches, monasteries and palaces still far exceed the number of businesses. After all, Medina is the old capital of the Maltese aristocracy, whereas Valletta has managed to unite the flair of knightly times with modern industriousness. Even today, Medina only has a population of 500. When the Apostle St. Paul lived three months on Malta in the year 59, Melite, present-day Medina, was the capital of the island. According to legend, Medina's cathedral was built precisely on the spot where St. Paul converted Publius, the island's Roman administrator Christianity. The cathedral blends in very well with its surroundings, and though not the original structure, the original church was dedicated to the Apostle in 1298. Just as in St John's Co-Cathedral in Valletta, the floor is covered with memorial slabs. However, here lie the local aristocracy, not the knights. The vaulting of the cathedral is painted with scenes depicting the lives of St Peter and St Paul. October in Medina is festival time. This annual event is staged to commemorate and communicate the city's past. For a week, most of the residents dress in period costume and take to the streets to greet the visitors. The many squares are turned into makeshift restaurants by the locals, serving typical Maltese food. The festivities are started each day by the bandu, the town crier, escorted around the city streets by modern-day Knights of St. John. citizens of Indina and those from other nations, the University of the City and His Serene Highness, the Grand Master wish you to attend the celebrations of the Indina and Rabat Festival. 
In ancient times, life in Malta was full of hardships. The street theatre performed during the festival tries to give some insight into the Maltese lifestyle during bygone days, depicting everyday events from cradle to grave. Throughout the festival, various reenactment groups travel from all over the world to further show some of the events that have shaped modern day Malta. For truly original souvenirs, the best place to go is one of the two craft centres on Malta. The largest is at Tawali, a former RAF wartime airfield. The practical Maltese have converted old, formerly unused aircraft hangars, workshops and barrack rooms into centres of craft production. Malta's centuries old and best known craft is still mainly done at home. Maltese lace has been made by generations of dedicated and patient Maltese women. As renowned as the lace these days is Medina glass. At Tawali you can witness its production right from the first firing through to it appearing on the shelves of their own shop. On the west coast of Malta is one of the tackiest tourist sites. It is the film set for the 1979 Robin Williams movie Popeye. Director Robin Altman took the trouble to build a small picturesque wooden village known as Sweet Haven, which he used as a background and set for filming the comic strip film. Once the film was released, the set became an instant tourist attraction. Since its opening, the village has burned to the ground twice, but it has unfortunately been painstakingly rebuilt by the proud Maltese each time. The cliffs of Dingley are a very attractive coastal strip several kilometers long. For the most part, between the ridge of the more than 650 foot high cliff and the sea, there is a narrow cultivated terrace. In some places, the cliffs fall precipitously into the sea. The best and most impressive spot can be reached by hiking two miles from the village of Dingley and following the coast until you reach the Busquet Gardens. The result is some spectacular views of the rugged coastline. The Blue Grotto is reached only by boat. Small fishing boats depart from Wa'id al Zuriek as long as the weather and a calm sea cooperate. This rugged stretch of steep coast, interrupted only by the watchtower of Torre Scuto, built in 1637, is already worth the journey. The boat enters into several grottos that provide the onlookers with a fascinating kaleidoscope of colours as the rays of the sun and the many coloured algae merge inside. The biggest of all is the Blue Grotto itself, at almost 100 feet high and about 290 feet wide. Here the interplay of lights are particularly fascinating. The village of Mostar, situated on the edge of urbanised Malta, boasts one of the most impressive churches in the whole country. This place of worship dedicated to the Assumption of the Virgin Mary was built between 1833 and 1860 and was financed solely by private individuals and volunteer work of the town's inhabitants. The neoclassical structure has a rotunda and its overall shape reminds one at once of the Roman pantheon. The whole circular interior is spanned by a huge and very impressive dome. The dome is made of Maltese stone and was placed in position virtually without cement. It is the fourth largest dome in Europe, after the domes of St Peter's, 
St Paul's Cathedral in London and the one built over the parish church of Shakia in neighbouring Gozo. Visitors to the church can see in the freely accessible sacristy a German bomb dropped by a bomber on the 9th of April 1942. It made a hole in the dome and landed on the floor, but it didn't explode and never hurt anyone, which was instantly interpreted by the pious inhabitants as a miracle. Massa Schlock is Malta's most important fishing village. With calm blue waters and bobbing Luzu boats, this quaint and picturesque harbour is a photographer's paradise. Despite the vast numbers of day trippers, the basic structure of the village remains largely untouched. The bright and colourful fishing boats are anchored in the cove alongside the quay or sometimes dragged ashore so they can be repainted or repaired. This most idyllic place is worth a visit any time, but especially on a Sunday morning when Malta's largest weekly market takes place alongside the harbour wall. Massa Schlock Bay has seen some difficult events in Malta's history. It was here that the Turkish fleet anchored prior to the Great Siege of 1565 and the French also used the bay prior to their invasion of 1798. Most of the tourist accommodations are in and around the place where the Apostle St. Paul supposedly came ashore. The formerly small villages situated here have all grown together to become a large tourist resort. Aura, Bujiba, St. Paul and Semshima now form the small city that is given the unofficial name of St. Paul's Bay. What were once sleepy fishing villages have now become a lively place filled with dozens of hotels, countless holiday flats and endless rows of restaurants, bars, discos, souvenir shops and travel agencies. Only one thing is lacking though, beaches. So those who would prefer to swim in a sandy cove instead of dipping into the waters of the rocky coast or the crowded numerous pools of the hotels must hire a boat or a car or take a bus to one of the nearby beaches. Due to Malta's generally high and rugged coastline, there are few sandy beaches, quite unlike any other island in the Mediterranean, all of which use the beaches as the main tourist selling point. That doesn't mean that the beaches here on Malta are poor. On the contrary, they're quite clean and slope gently into the warm sea. Malta's longest sandy beach lies below the coastal road and is found at the inner end of Malia Bay. Opposite Valletta across the Grand Harbour sits what is known today as the three cities Vittoriosa, Senglia and Conspicua. All are heavily industrialised. Very few tourists come to this part of the island but it's the perfect place to see the real Malta. Senglia is a lively little city characterized by tall apartments, all fully restored after World War II, in which the shipyard and dock workers and their families live today. The only interesting site is the so-called Vedette, situated on the tip of the peninsula on which the city is built. The small former sentry post, high above the Grand Harbor, offers one of the best views in the urbanized part of the island. The half-reliefs depicting two eyes and two ears stand for the alertness of the defenders of Malta. Before the Knights founded Valletta, they lived in Burgu, present-day Vittoriosa. Thus, not Valletta but Burgu was the object of the Turkish siege of 1565. Nowadays, one never gets the feeling that Vittoriosa was ever the capital as historical monuments are few and far between. Its inhabitants work mostly in the harbour docks. The feeling that you have though is that Vittoriosa lies somewhere in southern Italy. Vittoriosa occupies the peninsula between Calcara and Dockyard Creek. On its tip is historical Fort St Angelo, built by the Knights before the Great Siege on the foundations of older Byzantine and Arabic fortresses. 
Fort St. Angelo, which until 1979 was the headquarters of the British Navy in the Eastern Mediterranean, with an admiral and full staff, stands proud, still today looking like it's guarding the Grand Harbour. On the other side of Valletta sits Salima. Salima is the largest and most modern town on Malta, a fashionable residential area and a noted resort. It has a five kilometer promenade, one of the most frequented on the island. It also possesses a large shopping area with some well-known and familiar names. Slima is quite a new town and has grown dramatically over the last few years, emerging as one of Malta's major tourist centres. It was originally planned as a small resort for the residents of Valletta, with its pleasant coastline indented with little coves. It was to here they would come during the hot summer to swim and take in the fresh air. The main focus of activity is on the strand. From here, ferries connect with Valletta and many of the boat cruisers set off around the islands or out into the blue Mediterranean. The strand buzzes with calves and bars and from here are some of the most spectacular views of the capital Valletta across Martsumshet Harbour and as the sun goes down the views get even better. Valletta sets itself apart from the rest of the island. The capital is characterized by the impressive Grand Harbour and Marsam Shet Harbour, which also serve the function of separating the capital from its suburbs. For example, in order to reach Floriana, a deep moat and a wide street corridor have to be crossed first. What holds them together is the wide, round front of the city gate, with its prominent Triton fountain in the middle. The square is also Malta's most important bus station. When the British granted the island independence in 1979, one legacy they left behind was an efficient public transport system. Unfortunately, they also left the buses, mainly Bedford and Leyland in origin. If in Britain, they would all be in museums. The best way to visit Valletta is on foot as parking is truly a nightmare. With most visitors entering through the city gate, this controversial edifice was built in 1968 after the original from the 16th century was torn down, mainly because it hindered the passage of modern traffic. And it's not liked by the locals at all. One walks through the contentious city gate to reach the inner core of the venerable nightly city. An important traffic artery, the Republic Street starts here and slowly winds its way like a backbone to the top of Monte Scriberis and down to the end of the peninsula until it reaches Fort St. Elmo. Republic Street is ideal for shopping and many of the island's best shops are here. For relaxing after all these sights, Valletta's few open-air cafes are also found here. One such cafe is in Republic Square, the Cafe Cordina. Here, as you sip your drink, you are quite likely to be entertained by a local group. From Republic Street, many other small streets leading to both harbours originate. It's hard to get lost in Valletta, because the whole city was laid out in a checkerboard pattern. The city's very dense population creates the need of many storied houses and endless flights of steps. Bay windows are popular and they're often built in the most unlikely places. All available space is utilized. Even the secondary streets are full of shops and small bars. 
Some of these bars did brisk business when the large British naval base still operated here. Now, many of them look run down. Only in the lower part of the street can you get a feeling of what things used to be like. Stray Street, known to generations of sailors as the gut, used to be busy and vibrant, with bar after bar festooned with ship's crests and cap tallies, open most of the night. In the heart of Valletta stands the largest secular structure of the capital, the imposing palace of the Grand Master of the Order of St. John. Its two-storied facade faithfully conveys the austerity of the mid-16th century when the great siege had just concluded. The wooden bay windows in the corners are of a later date. Both Baroque portals were only added in the 18th century. However, the two inner courtyards around which the different palace wings group themselves are surprisingly cheerful. First, there is the Neptune court with a statue of the sea god of antiquity towering over a fountain. The palace used to be the official residence of the British governors during colonial times and is now the place where the Maltese Parliament holds session. It's also the official residence of the Maltese President. The armory is reached from the Neptune Court and is the place to see many of the 5,700 weapons and armor of the Knights of the Order. Perhaps the most outstanding of all is the armor of the Grand Master Aloft de Winnicourt, with many gold decorations and the equally impressive armor of his predecessor Martin de Gareth. From the Prince Alfred court, a spiral staircase takes the visitor to the upper story, where the royal apartments used to be. At first, one walks past the 31 meter long palace corridor, filled with ceiling paintings showing all the battles and privateering voyages of the Maltese. In the yellow room, frescoes depict the early history of the order. Here, for example, the visitor can see how the knights paid the ransom to the Egyptian Sultan for the release of King Louis IX in 1250. In the ambassador's room, one can learn about the history of the order by way of additional enormous frescoes. In the armchairs, noted personalities such as Pope John XXIII, George Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev have sat. The Hall of the Supreme Council is decorated by 12 frescoes depicting the Great Siege of 1565, whilst the huge, luxurious state dining room, on the other hand, is decorated by numerous portraits of the British kings and queens. Also filming in the Grand Master's Palace was the well-known face of Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, who proved it wasn't just us that had trouble with the commentary. The most impressive church in Villetta is the main church of the Order of St John. St John's Co Cathedral is dedicated to St John the Baptist. After the Knights left the island, it became part of the Archdiocese of Malta and Pope Pius VII gave it the rank of Episcopal Church in 1816, which until that year only the Cathedral of Emdina had, which explains the strange name Co Cathedral. The Cathedral of St. John was built from 1573 to 1777 in accordance to the plans of Girolamo Casa, who in reality was not a civil or religious, but a military engineer. This is readily seen in the church's strength plainness and austerity. However, the interior is completely different, which comes as a pleasant surprise. Mattia Preti redesigned and redecorated the whole interior in the mid-17th century, paying for all expenses out of his own pocket. Of note are the ceiling paintings showing 18 scenes from the life of St John the Baptist, painted by Preti himself but also the preparatory drawings for the numerous reliefs that completely cover all columns and wall surfaces. Yet the most unusual feature is the floor of the church. It is fully covered with 375 memorial slabs, with beautiful inlaid work using many different kinds of coloured marble. The slabs are covered with inscriptions, seals, skulls 
and skeletons that tell the story of the knights buried there. Each one of the chapels on both side aisles are dedicated to the respective tongues, the subgroups of the orders. On the left side one can see the chapels of Germany, Italy, France, the province and finally the mutual tongue of Bavaria and Great Britain. On the right side there are the chapels of Portugal, Castile and Aragon. The oratory of the church was reserved for the prayers of the novices and was designed by Preti as well. However, the large altar painting from the year 1608, by the way the most important painting in the whole nation, was created by none other than Michelangelo Marisi de Caravaggio, better known simply as Caravaggio, one of the most outstanding painters of all times. Employing his typically realistic style, this Baroque painter tells the story of St John the Baptist's beheading. With unequalled expressive power, strong lights and shadows, and a lot of drama. A visit to the National War Museum is a must. The museum is situated in the outworks of Fort St. Elmo. Many photographs and artifacts vividly portray the sorrow and bravery of the Maltese population during the Second World War. Pride of place goes, of course, to the George Cross presented to the island by King George VI. Other exhibits include Faith, one of the three RAF Gloucester Gladiator biplanes, which were Malta's only air defence when war was declared by Italy in 1940. The other two, of course, being named Hope and Charity. And Husky, the jeep used by both General Eisenhower and later President Roosevelt. The museum is packed to the rafters with uniform, equipment, unit badges and photographs. Sacra Infirmeria, the original hospital of the Knights, was built as early as 1575. The Sacra Infirmeria was regarded back then as possibly one of the most modern and generous institutions caring for the sick and injured. It was exceptional because each sick person had his own bed. The six large wards had room for a total of 700 beds. The largest ward measured 160 meters and has been very well preserved. Nowadays it's been converted into an exhibition room and restaurant for large groups. When the Knights ruled over Malta, the doctors and nurses were trained by the order itself. Even the aristocratic members had to care for the sick on a regular basis something unheard of in other countries, as most of the sick belonged to a much lower class. There was even a small ward for non-believers, mainly Muslim prisoners. In the underground vaults, the exhibit titled The Knights Hospitallers clearly and graphically illustrates the story of the Knights Hospital by way of elaborate sets having original objects, models and figures. A trip to Valletta is not complete if you haven't seen the city from the walls and bastions of the two harbours and not participated in a tour of these harbours from Salima. Only the person who's done both can really appreciate the incredible architectural achievement of the 16th to 18th century Maltese. We must keep in mind though that Malta was heavily bombed during the Second World War to appreciate the post-war reconstruction effort even more.